listening to SOJC Radio, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and teaching the doctrine of Christ to the whole world. Good evening and welcome to Friday night SOJC Remnant Gathering. Grab your Bible and your pens and your paper and when two or three are gathered in his name, the Lord is right here with us. So thank you for joining us and here's Brother David. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the December 8th, 2023 edition of the FOJC Remnant Gathering. I am David Carrico, and it is my great pleasure to be here for the next hour teaching the Word of God. And our message for this evening is entitled, The Mystery of the Urim and the Thummim. And it is, as always, our great pleasure to be here with you. And we have an announcement to make and a lot of announcements really but we want to make the announcement for our December Prayerathon and this will be on December 25th at 3.30 p.m. in the afternoon and we will broadcast that over our Underground Church YouTube channel so we're going to make a big deal out of prayer we've got to pray and we're seeing a lot of answers to prayer and uh, that's what it's all about we pray we obey and the Lord brings forth the fruit of uh, things to pray about this evening of uh, Jeannie and her husband her husband is sick he needs 24-hour care and they're having problems with insurance we're hearing a lot of that I mean my goodness and uh, we certainly want to pray for Jeannie and oh boy it's bad enough to have problems and then to have problems in that realm too is really bad Um, Kevin and his sister they need protection and healing Uh, Cecil's brother was hospitalized with um, breathing problems we want to continue to pray for him Carol for her daughter and also for her husband for healing uh, we want to pray for healing for Sky, and uh, absolutely and also Sherry's daughter Dara needs healing uh, we want to continue to remember Dara what else Donna hop in here uh, Matthew for um wisdom and salvation he is in prison so we want to be sure and remember him is that the young man we met at Pentecost Uh, no David okay another man okay I think all right um Um, and then um uh dear G uh needs help uh she needs healing and um you know wisdom Thank you so much for those prayers. I, uh, you don't understand how much it means. People count on us to pray. So, um, thank you so much. Uh, Kemp needs prayer too for his daughter. Who is that, Donna? Kemp. Okay. I'm running through these emails really All quickly right. here. And we are very conscientious about praying about every request we get. And like I shared last week, I always read the letters, all the mail, and I love, drop us a letter, drop us a line, write to us at the post office box. And I love to pray over the request when I read the letters. And uh, we pray, we put some every week that we make mention of, but just because we don't mention it doesn't mean we pray, don't pray over it. And we'll be over many many more requests uh, on uh, December 25th and yeah we can have a prayer thon there because this is the day the Lord hath made uh, even though the devil has done much to sully that day uh, it is still the day the Lord hath made and we're going to rejoice in prayer I do want to remind on that day to use the prayer thon page because it has the, the form on it makes it so much easier for Need to sort through the emails, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, 
And remember FOJC Radio, by the way. Uh, we, Don and I, Sister Don is here at my side, and she has been. This is our 40th year, our 40th year of ministry. And pray for us that the Lord just continues to um, give us the strength and the motivation. And I can honestly say we're more motivated now than we ever have been in our ministry. And uh, we've got so we're we've made several announcements. We're going to have several more announcements that'll be coming forth uh, within the next few weeks. New people will be presenting on uh, the network that I've never presented before. Uh, new series, new special broadcast. So we're just so thankful with what the Lord is doing, and uh, just pray for us that the Lord will continue to uh, just do what he's doing. It's all about him. You know, we obey, we pray, and we watch the Lord work. And I want to say also that uh, there was a certain young lady here for our last prayer-thon, and if she would want to come back on Christmas Day and be a part of this one, I want to say, you know, could just come on with it. All right, then. Let's pray. Father, We thank you so much for this opportunity to come before you and lift up these requests before a holy and loving God. We want to pray for Jeannie's husband. Father, not only that you touch him physically and give that touch that comes from the cross of Calvary, that that healing come to him. And Father, this extra stress from the insurance drama, Father, just intervene in that situation and make a way for Jeannie and her family. We want to pray for Kevin and his sister that you'll just give them protection and give them healing and give them wisdom in everything that they have to deal with. We want to pray for Brother Cecil Cobb's brother. Father, he's been afflicted in his lungs and father we know that that healing has begun and we pray in jesus name that you just touch him with your mighty healing power and just make him every whit whole in jesus name we want to pray for carol's daughter and her husband rick they need healing and father in jesus name we just pray that you just touch him now and also for sky Father, we just thank you for for her and for her faithfulness. And Father, we just pray that you just let that healing touch come upon her now in Jesus' name. From the stripes that you bore upon your back on Calvary's cross, we just pray, Lord Jesus, now that by your stripes we are healed. And we just let that healing anointing by faith be released the sky now in Jesus name we want to pray also for Dara that you'll just continue healing and working in her life we want to pray also for Matthew who's in prison father in Jesus name just let your presence be real to him and though he be behind bars he can be free in Christ we want to pray also for Dara Day for healing and also for Kemp in Jesus name we just bring these requests to you Father and we just commit them to you knowing that they are certainly uh, worthy cries from your children this evening so Father we just lift these up to you in the mighty name of Jesus we pray amen and amen worship the Lord for a few moments and we're going to be back with our teaching for this evening the mystery of the Urim and the Thummim. We're sorry, but because of copyright rules, you cannot hear my music. However, if you want to hear the message in its entirety with my music, you can join us on the radio page on Friday night for the live audio broadcast at 6 p.m. Central Time, or you can listen on our podcast page at fojcradio.com. Here's Brother David. Turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 8. The mystery of the Urim 
and the Thuman. And of Levi he said, Let thy Thuman and thy Urim be with thy Holy One, whom thou didst prove at Massah, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. Now, the Urim and the Thurim, according to the scripture, was on the breastplate of the high priest, and they are never specifically explained. It's left as a mystery, but I believe that that mystery is totally understandable when we diligently study the Word of God, that we can know just what the Urim and the Thurim were. And in this scripture here, it speaks of who they belong to. There was a Urim and a Thummim upon the breastplate of the high priest of Israel. And it says here who they really belong to. It says that they belong to the Holy One whom thou didst prove at Massah. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, we learn just who that was. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 8 through 11, Neither let us commit fornication, as some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. The one they were really tempting in the wilderness was Jesus. He was there with them as the angel of the Lord. And it was Christ himself that they were tempting and resisting. Adam Clark on this text in Corinthians said this, I have already supposed in the note on verse 4 that Christ is intended by the spiritual rock that followed them and that it was he, not the rock, that did follow or accompany the Israelites in the wilderness. This was the angel of God's presence who was with the church in the wilderness, to whom our fathers would not obey. So the Urim and the Thurim that was upon the breastplate of the high priest of Israel really belongs to the real high priest. Jesus is our great high priest, and he is the one that has the Urim and the Thummim. Now, if you look in the Hebrew, the word Thuman, uh in Strong's or in uh, any other your standard lexical works, it means perfections. Thuman means perfections. And Urim is number 224 in the Hebrew. And the word study New Testament gives this definition. It means fire, the light of fire, a flame, enlightenment, revelation. It is particularly used in the expression Urim and Thuman. Now, let's go to the first mention in Scripture. That's always a good thing to do, to go to the first mention of something in Scripture and go from there, and this sets the tone for the understanding. Now, let's go to the book of Exodus, chapter 28 and the 30th verse, and it says this, and thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim. This was something that was put into the breastplate. And they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. Now, I have a couple people here that I want to refer to that I think really had this figured out. Number one, Thomas Koch, who was John Wesley's friend. He became the great uh, apostle to India, founded so many churches in the country of India. And to this day, I had to go and order from India to be able to buy his commentary. But this is what Thomas Koch said. As to their form and substance, it seems highly probable that they were no other than the twelve precious stones inserted into the high priest breastplate. Now, I believe Brother Colk is exactly correct that the Urim and the Thummim are the stones in the high priest breastplate, and we're going to unpack that and let you see it for yourself 
right from the scripture. And I want to read also from John Gill. And it was really John Gill that gave me my boom moment this week. Uh, He preached a sermon, uh, Levi's, Urim, and Thummim. And this is what Brother Gill said in that. He agrees with Brother Coke. He says, but the opinion which at present I am most inclined to come into is that the Urim and Thummim were no other than the twelve stones in the breastplate on which were engraven the names of the twelve tribes of Israel, and that these were called Urim because they were clear, lucid, and transparent, and Thummim because they were perfect and complete, had no blemish or defect in them. Now, We'll go to the next use of the Urim and the Thummim in Exodus chapter 39, verses 8 through 10. And in one scripture, it'll talk about the Urim and the Thummim. And in the next, it will talk about the stones, you see. And you can see when you put the scriptures together that the Urim and the Thummim and the stones are used interchangeably. Let's let's read it. In Exodus 39, let's begin in verse 8. And, and he made the breastplate of cunning work, like the work of the ephod, of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. It was four square. And they made the breastplate double, a span with the length thereof, and a span the breadth thereof being doubled. And they set in it four rows of stones. The first row was a sardius and a topaz and on and on and on. So in Exodus 39, it mentions the stones and doesn't mention the Urim and the Thurman. And in Exodus 28, it mentions the Urim and the Thurman, but not the stones, and it's all on the breastplate. So I think we're looking here at the Urim and the Thurman, the stones being the same thing when you really picture and try to see just exactly what's going on. Now, the Urim and the Thurman, was something that when it was consulted uh, in Joshua. Joshua was the leader of the army when they went in to fight the Nephilim in the land uh, of Canaan. But Joshua was in submission to the high priest that had the Urim and the Thummim. And Joshua, though the leader of the army, he had to move at the order of the high priest that had the Urim and the Thummim. This was a very holy and a special thing by which God spoke to his people and led them. Now, how did it work? And there's a lot of theories out there. Some people think it was kind of like, literally, they think it was like a magic eight ball to where, you know, they would shake it up somehow and... Uh, it'd give the the right answer, or they would cast a lot, like throwing dice, uh, or maybe one would light up for yes, or one would light up for no. But I absolutely reject all of these ideas. I think all of these ideas cannot be right because of what it says in the Word of God, in the book of Deuteronomy, one of the things, these are just way too close to divination. Like when the apostles, when they tried to choose a replacement for Judas, they cast a lot. It was like, okay, little Joe from Kokomo, we'll take Matthias. And I'm sure Matthias was a fine guy, but God chose the apostle Paul. Paul was obviously the 12th disciple. We never hear anything further of Matthias, but we hear a lot about the apostle Paul. God doesn't work through divination. Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 and verses 10. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. And divination is using occult means to find out knowledge. Reading tea leaves, crystal balls, anything like this would fall under the category of divination. So if that's what it isn't, well, what was it? Now let's go to the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, let's look at chapter 27, and let's look at the 21st verse. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word 
they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And this speaks of the leadership of the army not being on Joshua, but being on the high priest. It has to be the high priest here. Eleazar that gave the word through the Urim and Thurim before Joshua could move. Now, this doesn't say, it says the, the high priest gave the word, but how did he get it? How did the high priest get the word from the Urim and the Thurim? And I think there is one conclusion that I have to come to, and there have been other scholars have come to the same conclusion, that it had to have been a voice. It wasn't Little Joe from Kokomo. It wasn't that magic eight ball. They didn't cast the, the lots. But that high priest, when he sought God as the representative of the Israel of God, God spoke to him. I don't know if it was an audible voice, or I don't know if it was a voice that just spoke to his mind. Sometimes when the Lord speaks to your mind, it it is clear, and it is distinct as if he was standing in the room, and even more so. Joseph Benson had this to say. He said, this was another friend of John Wesley's. This is probably, I think, the oldest Bible commentary I have an original print of in the early 1800s. But he said this, It appears from several passages that the high priest in consulting the oracle was clothed with the ephod or the sacerdotal vestment which belonged to the breastplate and the urim and the thummim. Thus, when David wanted to consult the oracle, he said to the priest, Bring thither the ephod. In this and in other places, God is said to have answered him, only it appears to have been a voice. The voice of God spoke. When we're obedient, God will do his part. It was laid out. Yeah, the high priest, he puts the ephod on. Every piece of the high priest's garment was specifically laid out. How it was to be made, how it was to be worn, how he was to go into the most holy place on the Day of Atonement. And all of this was prefiguring the great high priest that would come, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, that he is the one to whom the Urim and the Thummim really belongs. Now let's test this. Is this just a good idea, or was it really a voice that spoke to the high priest? And I believe it was. And like I say, I don't know if it was an audible voice, a voice in the mind, but the Lord spoke. Now let's just read some scripture. And let's read some scripture. First Samuel 23 and 6, and it says here, And it came to pass when Abathar the son of Ahimelech fled to David in Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Now, this is when the Urim and the Thummim came unto David. It was brought down by Abathar, the son of Ahimelech. And as we read on in 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 6, and when Saul, and, and this shows the connection between calling on the Lord and the phrase inquiring of God. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor the prophets. And inquiring of God in something specifically they wanted to know, they went to the Urim and the Thummim. Now, First Samuel chapter 30. Let's read verses 7 and 8. And David said to Abathar, the priest, to Himelech's son, I pray thee, bring me thither the ephod. And Abathar brought thither the ephod to David. And David inquired at the Lord. There's that phrase again, inquiring of the Lord. There was a very specific process. There was prayer. There was seeking God. There was intercession. Then there was inquiring of the Lord in important matters, which was most holy and sacred and was done through the Urim and the Thummim. And in verse 8, And David inquired at the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue his troop? Shall I overtake them? And the Lord answered him. And the Lord answered him. When David inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him. 
You see, it was a voice. Pursue not, for thou shalt surely overtake them, and without fail recover all. The Lord spoke. It was a voice. In Second Samuel chapter 5 and verse 19, here it is again. And David inquired of the Lord, there's that phrase again, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into my hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. David asked, he inquired of God with the ephod, the Lord answered. The Urim and the Thurman was a process that the Lord laid out whereby the children of Israel received the most direct leading from the Lord. Brother Gill agrees with this conclusion. Brother Gill says this. Uh, he said, but I am most inclined to think that God gave the answer by a distinct and articulate voice. My reasons for it are because in Numbers, when the priest asks counsel of God, it is said, at his word or at his mouth, that is, of the Lord shall they go out, and at his word or mouth shall they come in. And when David ordered Abathar the priest to bring the ephod to him, and he inquired of the Lord, saying, Will Saul come down? And the Lord said, He will come down. Thus I have endeavored to give you some account of the Urim and Thurim, which I suppose to be the twelve stones in the breastplate. And I agree absolutely 100% there with Brother Gill. Now, let's think about this. Let's think about this. Also, it was very, very specific that the things that belonged to the high priest, they weren't just for anybody. You know, it wasn't just for anybody to run up and grab that ephod and uh, put that breastplate on. So why was David so brazen to do that? And brazen isn't the right word. He was bold. How and why did David do that? Well, I'm going to show you why he did. Let's read Psalm chapter 110 and verse 1. And you remember when we began our study in Deuteronomy 33, 8, it said that the Urim and Thurman belonged to the one with whom they strove with in the wilderness, and that was Christ himself. Now, Psalm 110, verse 1, and the scripture says this, The Lord said unto my Lord, and this is a psalm written by David, The Lord said unto my Lord, capital L-O-R-D, capital L-O-R-D, The Lord, one is the Father, and one is the Son. The Lord said unto my Lord, We're hearing a divine conversation here within the Godhead. Sit thou at my right hand, when Jesus rose from the dead, he went to the right hand of the Father, didn't he? Until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Goodbye, preacher of rapture. Because he is going to stay at the right hand of the Father until he crushes his enemies at Armageddon. Verse 2, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauty of holiness from the womb of the morning. Thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Right here is the revelation of the Melchizedek priesthood to David, David got it. He understood that yes, that Levitical system, it was right and it was fine, it was proper for a time, but just like Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy 33 and verse 8, it really belonged to that great high priest that would come and fulfill all the types and the shadows, die upon the cross, raised to the right hand of the Father. He still has the Urim and the Thuman, and David understood that there was a greater priesthood. There was a priesthood that was there and also we've done teaching on the Melchizedek priesthood that the Melchizedek priesthood never ceased it existed side by side with the Levitical and we've done whole teachings on that but let me let me give you another example here let's go to the gospel of Matthew and we'll see here that David was not moving in some kind of haughty rebellion but David was moving anointed by the Holy Ghost as a priest of the order 
of Melchizedek, which he wrote of in the 110th Psalm, the one to whom the real Urim and Thummim belong and in whose hands they are at this very moment, to the one that really has those answers. He is the one to whom we seek that will give those answers unto us. Now let's look at it again. Let's look at it in Matthew 12, verse 3 and 4. And this is Jesus speaking. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was an hungered, and they were and they that were with him, how he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread which was not lawful for him to eat? And this was when he was running from Saul. You can read the story in the Old Testament, and the 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 priest there also understood about the Melchizedek priesthood, and he gave it unto David, who was moving under the anointing of the Melchizedek priesthood, you see? And Jesus tells us this story. Didn't you ever hear about what David did? He went and ate the shoe bread. Wasn't lawful, but he did it. He did not sin because he was a priest after the order of Melchizedek, just like Jesus. Melchizedek, as is explained in Hebrews 5-7, through 7, he was a priest and he was a king. David was a king and he also was a priest. And this is the amazing uh, revelation of the Melchizedek priesthood and just what it means. Now, let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8. And I want to read something from Strong McClintock's encyclopedia and I think that I'll read the little bit from this article for you and this is one of the amazing amazing things about the Urim and the Thummim and this is from uh, the Encyclopedia of Biblical and Theological Ecclesiastical Literature they could have chose a shorter name couldn't they by McClintock and Strong and this is the same, same James Strong that did the Concordance well he was a busy guy and I mean, this is a huge work, and it's really, really good. I really like it. It's about, I have about 12, 15 volumes, whatever it is, but it's big. But this is what it says here on the article of the human and the Thurum. It says, among these may be noticed the notion that as Moses is not directed to make the Urim and Thummim, they must have had a supernatural origin especially created unlike anything upon earth. Now, we don't want to miss this one. When you read through the Torah, every piece of equipment of the tabernacle, every piece of the garments, it is specifically laid out how they are be, to be made. Nothing is said of the Urim and Thummim. And this has given the understanding for hundreds and thousands of years that there was something supernatural about the Urim and the Thummim and it was something that w was just really not like anything on the earth and indeed that is correct now what in the world is going on well let's figure it out now in Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8 let's read the scripture and all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him Speaking of the beast of Revelation 13, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus is called the Lamb that is slain from the foundation of the world. And Adam Clark's comment on this is very helpful. Brother Clark says this. He said, the year of the crucifixion is properly the commencement of Christianity. And you know, anymore they can't say uh, B.C. and A.D., they got to say before the Common Era. And it just really gripes my gizzard. When I see these Christian pre preachers, they go, oh, before the Common Era. Oh, shut up. My goodness. But anyway, that's just another one of the little irritating things to me. But go, Brother Clark, let's read the quote. The year of the crucifixion is properly the commencement of Christianity as the apostles then first began to promulgate the religion of Christ with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. But as Jesus was in the divine purpose 
appointed him from the foundation of the world to redeem man by his blood. He therefore is in a very eminent sense the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And Brother Clark is so right. Yes, when Jesus rose from the dead, this started the preaching of Christianity and of the final phase of the Israel of God. But way before God created anything, he agreed, the Son, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost agreed, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Before anything was ever made, the plan of salvation was in place that Jesus would die for our sins. And I believe at that time that one of the first things created were these twelve marvelous stones which are the Urim and the Thurim. I certainly believe Brother Strong and Brother McClintock is right. There's something about these stones. They're not of this world. They're, they're eternal. They're from someplace else. They're not mentioned anywhere when it talks about the instructions of making the breastplate. That's because they were already here. And the Lord gave them to Moses maybe when he was up on top of the firmament in Exodus 24. Maybe that's when he got them. But I want us to read um, this text in Malachi, and then we're going to take a break after these two scriptures. But listen to what the prophet Malachi says in Matthew, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 3, and he speaks about the purified priesthood that would be brought forth by the Messiah that would come suddenly to his temple. Math, Malachi 3 and 3, and he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering and righteousness now get ready to rejoice in the 17th verse and they shall be mine saith the Lord of hosts in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. The prophet Malachi, our last old covenant prophet, he prophesied that the Israel of God is likened under these precious jewels that the Lord will one day gather up. I believe these are the same 12 stones that were perhaps the very first thing he created when he set in place that plan of salvation we are the stones and the jewels that the Lord is going to gather up. We're going to take a break, and we got a lot more to say about the mystery of the Urim and the Thummim. We'll be right back in just a moment. We want to invite you to our monthly prayer-a-thon. The date for our prayer-a-thon will be announced each month on the prayer-a-thon page and on the many programs that we offer. We collect prayer requests from our special form on the prayer-a-thon page on our website, fojcradio.com, and also from the chat the day of the prayer-a-thon on the Underground Church FOJC on YouTube. Each month, we have a variety of members of our Remnant family who come together in our apartment to take turns in our office because they want to pray for your prayer-a-thon requests. If you send an email, please be sure and put prayer-a-thon in the subject line. And please get your prayer-a-thon requests in to our office by 1 p.m., the day of our prayer-a-thon. We have started the time a little earlier because of the children that are involved. So we're starting at 4.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. And I need to be able to get your emails and get them printed out and ready for our team. Please limit your words to 75. And please do use the form I've created on our prayer page. Thank you so much. God does hear our prayers. God does answer our prayers. 
We are so blessed to serve a God like Him. out there, you homeschoolers, and you children that get bored easily, hey, we've got a program for you, Drawing Living Waters. It's a program with Brian and Adam where they discuss biblical topics and they share scripture while Adam is doing a live drawing about whatever topic is at hand. Their focus is for you, a slightly younger audience, but some of us oldies love it too, and for homeschool kids so you can get excited and get into scripture and you will have scripture come to life before your very eyes. Brian and Adam are presenting this program in a way to help younger children understand what scripture really says and the, the things that it really reveals. I know sometimes you think us old people just talk over your heads. So we're doing this for you. So praise God and tune in Tuesday evenings at 6 p.m. Central Standard Time on the Underground Church FOJC on YouTube and watch the new Drawing Living Waters program with Brian Reese and Adam Yubara. Now back to tonight's message with Brother David Carrico on FOJC Radio. Welcome back to the FOJC Remnant Gathering. And as I always do, after the break, I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you that prays for us and that studies for us and that supports us with your gifts and with your kindness. It is so much appreciated and so much needed. We thank you so much from the bottom of a heart. And I said last week, I think I'll say it again, that uh, write us a letter. You know, we get a lot of emails, but I like letters because I read those. And I like to read the letters, and I like to pray over every request when the letters come in. So I won't put them away and forget about them. But write us a letter. Followers of Jesus Christ, Post Office Box 671, Tell City, Indiana, 47586. Thank you very much. Um, I don't a lot of time. I don't watch the chat. I ain't got time. But every once in a while, something catches my eye. And I, and I can't, you know, say something about every comment. I know we get a lot of good comments. But I also have poll around here. You know, I can do what I want. So I'm going to say a couple things about a couple comments here. Some good ones is we get a lot of good comments. But I want to say something. Um, there was a comment from a non-0663. The I am suffix in Hebrew makes a word plural. So the Urim and the Thummim are both plural words, which could mean one represents six stones and another another. Going on, it says, perhaps they did refer to the stones on the ephod. Stones like those are crystalline and have u- unique vibration and frequencies. Do they have supernatural abilities? Well, when they put the Urim and the Thummim on and God spoke to them, that was pretty supernatural, wasn't it? And we don't know all how this worked. But, you know, the God could have spoke without the Urim and Thummim, obviously, but God wants obedience out of us. So when the high priest was obedient, had his heart right, put on the Urim and the Thummim, God spoke. And what it had to do with it, whether it was more than obedience, I believe it was something more than that. Because the, the way I've said so often is that the way to understand what the devil does is that of a perversion and imitation of what Christ has done. And we've been talking a lot in, in our Cities Lost in Time episode and a lot of Midnight Rides about the, the, the stones in the obelisk. They had granite crystals in them, and they very much could have been a communication 
a device or or even perhaps a weaponry. So absolutely, there is something here, and just how it worked between the father and the high priest, we don't know, but it was absolutely supernatural and special. I believe that these could have very well been the very first thing that God created, these 12 stones of the Urim and Thummim that would go upon the breastplate of the high priest. Also, I think, was it Laura? What was the name of that? Uh, Laura... Laura, okay, Laura said that also in Joshua chapter 4, the stones are connected with the 12 tribes. That's exactly right. And you see, once you see this, so thank you all for helping me teach us here a little bit this evening. But, you know, once you open up this paradigm of the symbolism, biblical symbolism holds out throughout Scripture. You see it over and over and over again. And this certainly is there, my goodness, when the Lord is going to gather up his jewels. Amen. These very same jewels that were, I believe, the very first thing that he created. All right. Well, thank you very much. Let's let's go on just a little bit. Got some more things we want to look at. And let's go to the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. In Ephesians, the first chapter. And let's look at the fourth and the fifth verse. And this speaks of election the doctrine of election which a lot of people go completely off on tangents on but nothing to worry here Uh, it is just very straightforward in Ephesians 1 4 and 5 according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world In Revelation 13 and 8, the text said of Christ that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And here the text says that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. And before anything was created, And I believe right after those 12 stones were made, there was a plan put in place that everyone that would believe in Christ and live a holy life and conform themselves unto him in obedience, that they were a part of the elect. And this was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. The salvation plan was laid down before anything else happened. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We were chosen in him before the foundation of the world. Chosen in him, chosen in Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. That phrase there, in Christ, is a very important one that we want to understand. It'll keep us from the path of false doctrine and on the right to true doctrine. And let's look what uh, Albert Barnes in his commentary had to say. He's spot on. Second Corinthians 5.17, Brother Barnes said, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, the phrase, to be in Christ, evidently means to be united to Christ by faith or to be in him as the branch is in the vine. That is, to be united to the vine or so in it as to derive all its nourishment and support from it and to be sustained entirely by it. To be in Christ means more to be in church. You can be in church and it won't make you any more Christian, as they say, than being in a garage will make you a car. But to be in Christ means you are united to Christ by faith. You are united to him just like the vine is to the branch and draws all of our strength and our sustenance from it. In the 15th chapter of the Gospel of John, this is precisely the analogy that Christ lays down in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 5. I am the vine... Ye are the branches, he that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. In Christ it's all good, united to him by faith, much fruit's coming. For without me you can do nothing. 
without that uniting unto Christ, no true fruit is going to come forth. In verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he's cast forth as a branch. Pretty plain, isn't it? And is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. What does that scripture mean? It means exactly what it says. That's what that scripture means. Verse 7, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Now this is the key to understanding this scripture and many others. In Romans 8 and 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you're united to Christ by faith, there's no condemnation for you. There's nothing the devil can throw at you that's going to stick. If you are in Christ, united to him by faith, and drawing your strength and anointing from him, you're good to go. And notice this qualifying verse here, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, I want to show, this is my apostate Bible slam of the week. Let's look at Romans chapter 8 and 1 in the NIV, and I can show it to you in a lot of the other of the apostate Bibles that follow after the Westcott, Hort, Nesalolin text. But it says this, and a lot of people don't understand that these modern apostate translations aren't even translated from the same text the King James was, the uh, Hebrew Masoretic and Greek received text. A lot of these Hebrew root translations, they throw away the Hebrew text and they go <laughs> and they go with the German one, the Stuttgart Stigensia. Okay, figure that out. All right, but let's just read it. And you don't, if you don't have to know a whole lot. I, you know, you just have to just have a turn your discerno meter on for just a moment and i know many of you have but i know there'll be people here that listen to this that still think ah oh boy making a big deal out of this well we can't make a big enough deal out of it because it's sending people to hell romans 8 and 1 in the niv what is left off therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in christ jesus in diverse it was totally cut out who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Because you can't preach that when you're preaching that grace covers every sin and that you can sin like a dog and go to heaven and all of this garbage that's taught in this greasy grace apostasy. And, I mean, just ask yourself, do you think the Holy Spirit took that out? Or do you think the devil took it out? I mean, this is the devil's work and this is just absolutely obvious. Throw those demonic Bibles in the trash. Now, 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. And this is another uh, something that's very important for us to stand, understand. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given unto us eternal life. And this life is in his son eternal life is in christ it is not in us life is in the son so if we are in christ we are in eternal life but if we are not in christ united to him by faith if you think that you have immortality by yourself this is going to be a eternally fatal disbelief it absolutely is now First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. Uh, our sister pointed out the analogy in the fourth chapter of Joshua, how that the stones were likened to the tribes of Israel. Here we have it again. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 5. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. There we got it again. We're lively stones, we're holy priesthood. You see, and this is right back again to the stones on the high priest breastplate representing the people of God. We've got this symbolism all over our scripture. And it is indeed the correct understanding of the Urim and 
the Thuman. In the Gospel of John, the 8th chapter and the 12th verse, one of the meanings of the Urim was it means fire. It means the light of a fire, the flame of enlightenment and revelation. And truly this is in Christ, to whom is the true light of the world. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. In the first chapter of John, in the 18th verse, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Jesus Christ makes the Father known. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus said, the words that I speak are the words that the Father gave me to speak. Jesus reveals the Father to us. He is the ultimate revelation of God. He is the light by which we understand all of the Scripture. He is the light by which we understand what the Father is truly like. And He is certainly, He is the light, and that word Thuman, it means perfection, and truly all perfections belong to Christ in the epistle of the Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, the scripture says this, For in him, meaning Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principalities and powers. If you have Jesus, you are complete in him. And what all the false teachers will do, they'll say, well, you need to add something unto Jesus in the Bible. How about a little Nagamati? How about a little Kabbalah? Yeah, you need to read some Talmud. No, you don't. Christ is perfection. He is the one at the right hand of the Father that holds the Urim and the Thuman. We have everything we need in Jesus. We're complete in Him. In Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Everything that we need is in Jesus we need look no farther. We just need to seek Him with all of our heart. Second, that was Second Peter uh, one and four. I threw one in there on you, Sister Donna. I give Sister Donna a scripture list over there, and every once in a while, I get all about my little self, and I throw some throw a ringer on her every once in a while. I can do that. Now let's go to Nehemiah. Let's go to Nehemiah. And let's go to the 7th chapter and the 65th verse. And they had a situation where they were trying to uh, determine uh, what people had inbred with tribes that were inflicted with Nephilim blood. And uh, in Jeremiah 7 and 65, and the Tishratha, that means Nehemiah, who was the governor. And the Tishrathra said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. And that shows us a couple things. At that time, the Urim and the Thummim had been lost. Where it went, we don't know. And it might have just been taken right up to the throne of God. I'll go for that one. That to the one that it really belonged, that he now has it at the right hand of God. But they said, we can't really know for sure, uh, you know, who's got what in them, but the, the Urim and the Thummim can, you know. And to this day, when uh, the Bible speaks in Titus, and I'll just give you the scripture here. I want to turn to it because I love it. In the book of Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, and it speaks of an actual genetic change. And my goodness, we don't know what we got in our genetics. It's, it's hard telling what. And it you know, it really doesn't matter. In Titus chapter 3 and 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You see, Jesus has the urine and the thumen at the right hand of the Father, and when we are born again, we are 
changed genetically at the germline level and anything that is there that is impure or improper it is taken out and we are priests of the most high God and this is such an encouragement and something that is uh, such a great thing for us to have and you see the real priesthood the problem with the apostate priesthood and if you read through the book of Malachi it all deals with the priesthood and the corrupt priesthood but one of the problems is they could not get the goo out of their mouth to tell people what was clean and what was unclean Uh, in Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 26 her priests have violated my law They have profaned my holy things. They have put no difference between the holy and the profane. Neither have they shewed difference between the unclean and the clean. It's time for someone to get up and say what's clean and unclean. Not of our own ideas, but what is clean and unclean according to the word of God. And have hid their eyes from my Sabbaths, and I am profaned among them. Yet it's time for the real priesthood once again to say that maybe there's some folks that need to rinse the stench of pork and swine out of their mouth and need to go back to honoring the Sabbath day to keep it holy. You see, and people don't just, um, they just don't come into obedience by accident. That's the way we are. We have to have it spelled out for us. We have to have it spelled out for us. And it's time for that priesthood to say, yeah, there's a difference between the holy and the profane. There's a difference between the clean and the unclean. And it's a, it's a big deal whether you honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy or not. Um, Brother Gill said this. He said, this shows the difference and imperfection of Levitical priesthood and what need there was of another priest to arise with the true Urim and Thummim not after Aaron's order but after the order of Melchizedek I like to read the uh, there's a group that arose in Scotland uh, back in the 16 and the 1700s and they called them the Moral Brethren Moral like bone marrow Uh, Thomas Boston was one of the moral Scottish brethren. And what they taught, their whole thing, I call it the moral, they said God's law is the moral of the word of God. And that when you get back to obeying the word of God, you're getting back to the sweet moral of the real meat of the word. And that's the way it is. I'm a moral brethren. I'm with that. Until you understand that obeying God is not some option or some kind of a theological quirk you can adopt if you want to, but this is an absolute necessity. You are not even out on the playing field. Let's look at the book of Hebrews. In the book of Hebrews, in the seventh chapter, and they were Puritans, by the way. Those Scottish moral brethren, they were good Puritan boys. Yeah, they were. Hebrews chapter 7, beginning in verse 14, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood, and yet it is far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there arises another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life, for he testifieth thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. As Nehemiah stood there, they did not know who to put in the priesthood because they didn't know who had intermarried with a, a, a Nephilim blood. They said, we got to wait till the one comes that has the Urim and the Thummim, but now we are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation and a peculiar, peculiar people and we are made priest of God right now. We are the priesthood. We are the only priesthood that the Lord has. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 10, he says it again, And hath made us present tense, unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth, present tense, as in right now. And right now, the way to be a part of the priesthood 
the one that the Urim and the Thurim has has come. And when Jesus Christ, when you repent and you put your faith in Christ's death upon the cross as payment for your sin debt, our high priest at the right hand of the Father will send the Holy Ghost of heaven into your heart and you will be born again and you will be cleansed with the washing of regeneration and whatever you were, whatever, doesn't matter. All that matters is if you are born again and the moment you're born again, you are a part of the priesthood and the one with the Urim and the Thummim at the right hand of the Father and said, you are holy because of your faith in me and you are a part of this priesthood and by the way this reigning with Christ thing um, I love Handel's Messiah I really do I I can just sit and listen to that over and over um, it, the very first and that was born out of uh, Handel of uh, the church in London he attends is still there and uh, right in the midst of the Puritan uh, revival in the 1600s. And it was really as interesting, the first time Handel's Messiah was ever played, the lady that was singing the female lead fell into sin. And there was a scandal. And uh, she was going through a divorce. And of course, this was a real big deal back then. But when they put when they put on the performance they decided to let her sing her part anyway and this lady repented and when she sang her part there in uh in there in the hallelujah chorus there was a preacher there jumped up and said sister for this thy sins be forgiven thee there was such a move of the spirit of god when that lady spoke that this preacher just uh, jumped up and said for this your sins are forgiven you and of course it was cause of her repentance but anyway when Jesus returns, he's going to reign forever and ever, just like in Handel's Messiah. But there's also a reign spoken of for a thousand years. So if he's going to re reign forever and ever when he comes back, that uh, reign of a thousand years has to be pretty much before that, done it? That ain't hard to figure out. Now, let's see when it might be. How about right now? Revelation chapter, or excuse me, Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. For if by one man's offense... Death reigned by one. Much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Jesus wants to reign in life with us right now. And he is the one to whom we go for the answers. We no longer go and you know it's good to have godly counsel. It's good to have brothers and sisters. I always say, you know, the Bible says in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. It's good to have Christian brothers and sisters to get impact and bounce things off of. But ultimately, though we have many godly counselors, and that's the way that I look at brothers like um, Matthew Henry or Albert Barnes or Adam Clark. They're, they're good counselors, but we have only one teacher. And that one teacher is the Holy Ghost. And I challenge each and every one of us that when we need to hear from him, and boy, we need to hear from the Lord, don't we? That we go right to the throne of God. We come boldly before the throne. And by the way, Ephesians uh, 2 and 6 says, And hath raised us up together and made us sit together together. In heavenly places in Christ Jesus, Hebrews 4.16, come boldly before the throne, Colossians 3 and 1. Uh, if, ye be been, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Sister Donna's favorite verse. And this is what we do right here. Ephesians, and this is a prayer. This is the longest sentence in the word of God. It's one big, long, huge sentence in Ephesians chapter 1. And it's one big prayer, and this is the, let's just read it. And I challenge each one of us to pray this prayer. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17. This is Paul praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. This is our Urim and our Thummim. We pray 
for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be given us in the knowledge of Christ. Watch out, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding be enlightened. And like I said before, everything that Satan does is an imitation of that which God does. All through the occult world, they talk about opening up that third eye. We have a spiritual sight that the Lord will open us for us, open up for us. Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The biggest reason for unanswered prayer is unprayed prayers. So let's pray. Let's go to our great high priest at the right hand of God who has the Urim and the Thummim. As always, I want to thank each and every one of you for being with us for our study this evening. Um, this Sunday night, on FOJC Radio Sunday Night Live. We will have a Helps to Holiness teaching with Brett Graham and myself. Uh, it will be broadcast. I have a dual stream broadcast this week. It'll go live on uh, our uh, Underground Church YouTube channel and also on our FOJC Radio Rumble channel. And uh, Saturday night, I will be with John doing the Midnight Ride, as always. Looking forward to that. And we've got another Holy Commission boot camp that went up this week. Uh, just really enjoying those, and I know a lot of you are. Uh, just so thankful for that. And like I say, pray for us. we got a lot of stuff in the works. Uh, we've got new series that will be unfolding very soon. We also have special broadcasts. And we're going to have new people coming on that are going to be uh, contributing uh to FOJC. Looking forward again, as always, to our uh, prayer-a-thon. I tell you that uh, it's been a blessing to me. And I tell you what, it'll be a blessing to anybody that will take time to pray and seek the face of the Lord. we got to make a big deal out of prayer. Got to make a big deal out of it because um, if we don't, I mean, it's obvious, you know, you, you can't expect the Lord to work unless we pray and that's what we're going to do and you know something Charles Finney said and he said a lot better I kind of relate to his thought but he would he he really would get on folks sometimes and he would tell them that if if you pray and don't get up off your frozen chosen and do something uh you know don't expect anything to happen so yes absolutely we're going to do everything that we can possibly do, but we know and understand truly, uh, as I like to say so often, that whatever good comes forth, we know it's from him. And uh, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> All right. Well, until I'm just going to say God bless y'all. We love you. And until next Friday night, 6 p.m. Central, God bless you all from the FOJC Remnant Gathering. Thank you for listening and joining in fellowship with us here at FOJC Radio Remnant Gathering. You can contact us at FOJC Post Office Box 671 Tell City, Indiana 47586 or you can email us at lastdayschurch at cs.com. Or you may call us at 812-836-2288. You can check out our website at www.fojcradio.com. Thanks and God bless.